Professor Damian Tamburini. Yeah. The associate professor at Indovan University of Technology, the Geronimus Academy of Data Science. Yeah. The, the, sorry? Yeah, correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The Leaders with a double affiliation at the Polytechnic de Milano as well. At uh, Geronimo's Academy of Data Science, he lectures the big data engineering and deep learning courses while lending a hand in the machine learning pre-master course. His research interests rotate around data intensive service, DevOps or data ops, social software engineering and artificial intelligence software engineer. Damon has published over 150 uh, papers in either top journals or conference in software engineering, information system, as well as service and artificial intelligence computing. Also, Professor Damian has been an active contributor and led research in many EU FP6, FP7, H2020, and Horizon Euro projects such as S Cube, Moda Clouds, C Clouds, Dysonita, Dossi Cloud, Protect, Redon, Satellite, Destin, and more. In addition, Diamond is ACM Tozen, a editorial board member. Secretary of Wazistos Standardization TC, as well as Secretary of the IFIP TC2, TC6, and, and TC8WG on self oriented computing. Well, as you can see, uh, his background is so huge that our expectation now is also huge. So. <laughs> Of that <laughs> after this meeting, we can uh, keep eager to uh, follow your steps. So please, Professor, this is Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I'll do my best. I'll do my best to make it worth your while, and, and maybe we'll have some nice discussion towards the end. Uh, so thanks a lot for the introduction and uh, the kind words. Um, OK, so uh, just a few words on why and how I've selected this topic. Uh, as uh, uh, Sergio was saying, uh, I am a, well, I have a double affiliation, but I'm mostly uh, engaged with companies uh, over the, the world and Europe specifically, uh, dealing with machine learning operations problems. So I don't really work with fundamentals of uh, AI and machine learning, but how to operationalize those how to render them as a service, how to uh, train, test, deploy, and operate, and re-evaluate, uh, uh, evolve such models in action. That's really where this talk is uh, coming from, specifically uh, the companies which are working with, with YATS, with the, 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 the graduate school in which I dwell uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, these companies have prime experience on machine learning operations, but I was able to learn uh, that even in a small, relatively small uh, area such as Europe, uh, machine learning operations are uh, wide, but have massive problems, uh, both from a social and technical uh, perspective, which I will try to introduce uh, to you gradually. Now, uh, what kinds of what kinds of applications, what kinds of machine learning operations can we expect? What, what are we talking about? Uh, well, there's there is a, a huge variety of these applications, and that's also part of the problem. Uh, so uh, uh, I took the courtesy of of these images from uh, the O'Reilly book on data intensive uh, uh, architectural design, uh, and you can have uh, all sorts of uh, data intensive computing ranging from uh, uh, you know the islands uh, cross and spare of the sea of derived data, the realms of data flow, which also typically features Google technology uh, and the challenges thereof. Uh, you might have applications that range from stream analytics to derived data, data uh, exchange, evaluation, extraction, transformation, and loading, uh, and what have you. But uh, I guess the the point of uh, uh, of all of these islands 
is that um, uh, uh, many of these companies have decided to take a path uh, uh, in this voyage. This path is typically known as data intensive architecture. So they have their own architecture indoors. Uh, these architectures typically reflect uh, architectural styles like Lambda. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Lambda. It's, it's a basic, relatively basic data intensive compute style uh, in which you have uh, an ingestion layer uh, which is uh, remarked at the top right here. Uh, and then you have a service uh, and speed and batch processing layers, uh, which render uh, models to uh, their intended user. And these models are updated uh, more or less continuously. Uh, now in the scope of Lambda uh, and op machine learning operations on top of these kinds of architectures, what kinds of machine learning are we talking about? Well, in our sample, in the companies that are worked that have worked with us, we're talking about mostly supervised uh, and unsupervised learning, or even uh, hybrids between these. Uh, so that's about that's about uh, around fifty seven percent of the data intensive computing that takes place on those architectures, with a very small uh, minority on reinforcement learning. The rest is really a hybrid computing or uh, you know meta heuristics based. Uh, kinds of, of data intensive computing. But what are the, the, the technical characteristics of these, uh, uh, of these algorithms uh, uh, and these compute options? Um, well, you might not be surprised in knowing that the characteristics are actually pretty boring. Uh, so you have uh, windowed semantics, you have a knowledge base oriented type of computing, you have a cube based type of algorithm, you have uh, endless loops in which these uh, compute options are executed and operated. But at the same time, here's a plot twist in my talk, because I don't really want to talk about uh, the technicalities of uh, machine learning operations and the algorithms thereof. Uh, I want to talk about the people that are carrying out these operations and how their professional life and experience is unfolding in their own practice. Specifically, I came to, a, to the conclusion in about five years of working with these people that uh, uh, on the one hand, they are amateurs. So they are approaching an interesting discipline that they are very passionate about. Uh, but we, the practitioners uh, from a scientific perspective need to help them building safe and sustainable machine learning solutions. And I will tell you a bit more about uh, this conclusion uh, as the talk unfolds, but let me start from you know a few uh, definitions, like for example, machine learning operations. If you have not uh, heard of it yet, uh, know that it is essentially a spin-off of the DevOps movement dedicated to data and machine learning uh, uh, to be blended within uh, industrial contexts of DevOps uh, development and operations delivery. Now DevOps, I guess, doesn't really require or uh, uh, demand any formal introduction. Uh, it's pretty state of the art and state of practice right now. It is a typical assumption that you can uh, uh, build uh, code, uh, uh, test, deploy, release, uh, operate, monitor, plan, and re-evolve uh, any software solution at the click of a button. Of course, there's many practices, there's many tools, as you can see also from this slide, that would allow this way of working. Conversely, on the other end, data and machine learning operations rest on, uh, for example, the standard on uh, data mining, which is CRISP-DM, introduced by IBM uh, about 20 years ago. Now, CRISP-DM essentially says, do requirements engineering for your data, uh, come up with machine learning modeling goals, use these goals to prepare a model, operate and evaluate this model with the people that need to use it, deploy that model also, and then evolve the model uh, whenever uh, uh, such uh, uh, operation deviates from the expectations. Now, the people that are into these loops, the people that are carrying out machine learning operations are in fact amateurs. Uh, uh, and now I want to sustain this part of the argument with a number of facts that I've discovered with empirical research uh, in the scope of these companies. Um, fact number one, this I don't think is, is a big surprise. Over 90% of industries 
uh, in fact, in our sample, but this can be generalized all across Europe and the world, uh, they are in fact data intensive, but they don't really know what to do with their data. So to give you a stupid example, Hyman's, uh, which is a company that we're working closely with, Hyman's is one of the largest const construction manufacturers uh, and construction workers uh, in Netherlands, Germany, Belgium, uh, to some extent, France, uh, uh, it also extends uh, its operations overseas. So it has had uh, many uh, efforts in South Africa, for example, in, in South America, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, for road work quality alone, Hyman's is producing around 50 gigabytes of data per second. Now, this data, which is stored in all sorts of things from handheld devices to hardware uh, to actually vehicles uh, and so on, has a very short lifespan, uh, what is known as a data half-life. In the scope of Hyman's, for example, for road work alone, the half-life is around seven minutes. This means that you need to look at that data within the time span of seven minutes, and you need to do something within this time span, because if the seven-minute mark uh, is over, then the tar that has just been laid cannot be uh, modified uh, and cannot be uh, uh, changed or improved or evaluated in terms of quality. Here we are talking about the tar laying uh, on, on road work. Now, this is just a, a very basic example, uh, but Hyman's is not alone. <clears throat> Among uh, the companies that Yats is working with, uh, and again, as I said, there's about 300 of those. Uh, uh, there's a lot of examples, uh, like Shell, for example. Shell conducts uh, oil rink mining operations, but they don't really keep track of uh, the maintenance and operations of their own software uh, 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 when it comes to uh, uh, managing uh, oil rink operations themselves. So there is no, there's very little intelligence. I, I wouldn't say that there is no intelligence, but there is very little intelligence in the operations that Hyman's uh, and Shell, for example, are uh, putting into motion. Um, so these companies find, them, find themselves incapable of harnessing the, the full potential of big data. The big data revolution is not really a reality for them. And sometimes it actually only is a cost, a cost of maintaining the data or storing the data in a cloud infrastructure without possibly uh, doing anything. Uh, on that cost uh, or with that cost. Uh, uh, more beyond that, more facts, uh, uh, around 75%, 76% uh, data scientists are not computer scientists by training. So if I look at uh, the demands uh, uh, of the industry of uh, data engineering and data science, uh, these demands are increasing by around 4% per month with respect to their total uh, overall uh, IT departments. So let's say the IT department is about uh, 100 people. That means that four additional data engineers are required every month. But at the same time, only 15% can be filled by computer science, computer engineering backgrounds. Uh, to give you a, a refinement of this fact, only 20% of our students, and, and our students uh, deal with uh, data engineering and data management, data operations, uh, ideas. We have a master's degree on that. Only 20% of our students are from computer science, computer engineering background. Most of them are, in fact, from uh, mathematics or physics, from econometrics, from uh, some of them from computational psychology, some of them from computational sciences, which are in general arranged in all sorts of uh, cognitive computing studies, uh, biology, for example, computational biology thereof. And the point is, this number, this figure, this 20% uh, is not improving. Because immediately after uh, the bachelor's degree, uh, 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 AI-oriented uh, talent migrates towards the United States and Canada and North America in general. So this is, uh, is a trend which we have no way of inverting, uh, not yet anyway. Uh, we're trying to increase the numbers, but the point is 
North America simply pays more when uh, uh, your market offer uh, is more than, than it could be. There's simply no way around that. <clears throat> uh, what we're trying to do also, for example, in, in YATS, in our institute, is to diversify the offer uh, in such a way that this, the, the, uh, the professional figures that are formed uh, at the university level uh, become more and more specialized, which also leads to having uh, talent, uh, which is specifically designed to address uh, uh, specific sectors like e-government or smart agro-food or uh, infrastructure maintenance or uh, infrastructure operations even, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, fact number three, and I have just a few more, don't worry. Uh, I'm trying not to uh, get it too boring. But fact number three I find is one of the most uh, disgracious, namely uh, uh, around 88% data science teams are short of a data engineer by a factor of two. What does this mean? This essentially means that for every company, for every data science team in that company, so suppose Hyman's had uh, a data strategy and data governance in place, for that strategy, for those governance efforts, for every team in those efforts, uh, two data engineers are missing. What is the role of the data engineer? The data engineer is the software engineer, essentially, that takes the models and operationalizes them. Is The, the data engineer uh, is the guy or girl that uh, essentially makes the machine learning operations happen. Now, these engineers are short uh, uh, and the situation is not improving. Uh, so what you're seeing here is uh, a slide courtesy of uh, uh, Dice Hottest Tech Jobs in 2020, uh, uh, but there's probably an updated version which tells a similar story that uh, reflects that very same finding. Specifically, data engineers are uh, becoming dire and uh, the shortage of data engineers uh, is causing so much stir and turmoil around uh, 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 big data and machine learning operations uh, to make them enough to make them insustainable on the long run. In fact, some random and anecdotal figures say that around 80% data scientific initiatives fail uh, before they meet their demands and expectations. Now, I think my conjecture is that this fact, which I've just shown you, is partly responsible for that failure, which means money invested in data science goes wasted unless there are data engineers to take care of uh, the, uh, uh, the data initiative uh, just the same. What is more, let's dig deeper in the data engineers. Data engineers, the ones that are committed to the data science teams in industry uh, report uh, being uh, report uh, 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 overwork uh, in their own personal career. Uh, I'm showing here just a simple quote, which I took from uh, Katie Nugget's uh, data engineering reports. Um, they are the go-to person about anything data, uh, data-wise, data data-intensive or whatever, uh, which also means they are uh, victims of the so-called information overload. So they are overloaded with requests, they feel the pressure of such requests and eventually drop their job and change uh, simply for the pleasure of, um, of having a clean desk to start from every, uh, every so-and-so months. And what, what is more, uh, the turnover of these professionals uh, is amounting to uh, a period of months, which means if you manage to hire a data engineer, you will only be uh, able to keep him uh, or her employed in your own company for your own initiatives for around 12 months, which is uh, under a year, which is very, very little uh, if you want to build uh, a long-term uh, data exploitation, uh, data meshing strategy. Uh, uh, just to give you uh, uh, a couple of quotes uh, and the challenges uh, thereof, uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, to finding uh, random evidence for this fact, I would encourage you to go around the web and look for reports of overworked uh, uh, data engineers uh, 
uh, as they support data scientists, uh, because this is the real uh, peculiarity here. This is the real transition with respect to regular software engineering. Uh, in regular software engineering, you have engineers and to an extent scientists, so computer scientists, working for all sorts of professionals with all sorts of methods, like for example, agile methods. Now in the scope of AI engineering, in the scope of AI and machine learning operations, big data engineers work for data scientists which are not regular software users. They are scientists invested in their own model, which sometimes are too invested in those models to understand that the operationalization of those models is uh, near uh, impossible, which is part of, of the problem, obviously. Now, uh, fact number five, and I will uh, keep it at this. I have a few more, but I, I, I will try to skip them uh, uh, to... Uh, show you actually uh, a bit more about you know the the challenges in the future. Uh, fact number five is essentially that uh, forty seven percent, around half of the data engineering workforce leaves their position because of office politics, which means that the organizational culture of the company is not ready to embrace the uh, data engineering, data science um, uh, uh, endeavors that they are designed, that they are supposed, that they want to support, uh, but they can't uh, because the organizational culture is typically arranged in such a way to support uh, regular software and IT engineering, which is so much different when it comes to big data and data intensive computing and uh, the, the professional figures which are involved in uh, these kinds of, in these kinds of, uh, uh, of scenarios. Now, let me rephrase the conclusion uh, that I had uh, at the very beginning into the following one. Machine learning operations are in fact carried out by debutants. So uh, data scientists that were not trained as computer scientists. So they are in fact passionate, but they, they barely scratch the surface of what and how can be deployed and operated and evolved with respect to their AI models. And the engineers that are trying to help are so overworked that they need even more help from scientists, from practitioners around these scenarios. Now, are there major challenges? Uh, 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 I would call them frontiers uh, that these kids are um, uh, facing. Uh, uh, challenges that they, in fact, are called, are required uh, to sustain, to operate uh, for the, uh, the future, for the so-called sustainability of their operations? The answer is yes, there are. And there's uh, a number that we have found in the scope of this large-scale empirical research that we have uh, ran with uh, uh, the Yats Partners Industries. Frontier one, I would say, is explanation. Now, anything that has to do with uh, data, and if this data has been produced in the presence of or by means of a human, then there is a right of explanation by that human, which means, uh, uh, as encoded in the general data protection regulation uh, uh, emitted on uh, the 25th of May 2018, uh, every human uh, producing every bit of data has the right to have an explanation of what prediction has been made over that data uh, uh, and uh, uh, has a right to understand and know how that data was processed, by whom, under which data intensive objective, by which technology, with which purpose, and whether uh, that purpose is still personal, has the right of canceling and erasing such data. Uh, I'm sure you've heard quite recently uh, the fine that Meta received uh, a fine of 1.2 billion euros by the Irish Data Protection Commission. And this has been ratified by the European Union, which means this is an actual hot fine. Mark Zuckerberg's company cannot back down from paying this fine. And 1.2 billion is not like peanuts. 1.2 billion is a lot of money. 
So you can imagine that the uh, data intensive compute uh, uh, technologies that we are talking about and the kinds of uh, volume, even of money and of liability that can be put in motion in this context is massive. Uh, 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 and I mean, 1.2 billion can actually drive big companies to bankruptcy. So this is, this is really a showstopper for some companies. Uh, is it just a social networks problem or is it just a top tier uh, uh, cash cow companies uh, like Meta? No, it's not. Um, uh, I can give you a stupid example. All of the call centers that you have been in contact with, whether it is technical support or whether it is uh, pre-recorded uh, uh, publicity awareness, for example, uh, call centers. Um, now, all of the conversations that you entertain with these call centers, they are processed. All of them are recorded, processed, Data is extracted with natural language processing. So essentially, it's got NLP spilled all over it. And this NLP is used to calculate all sorts of trends, uh, whether it's trends concerning your behavior, whether it's trends concerning uh, your psychological status, whether, whether it's trends concerning uh, your desires and demands from a customer perspective. Uh, uh, these trends are analyzed, stored, further processed, sold even uh, to the best possible offer uh, and so on and so forth. Now, all of this happens in pretty much every company because every company has at least one call center which is being used to handle the operations of that company. For example, we are working with KPN. KPN is essentially uh, uh, the, the major telco company in the Netherlands. Uh, now, KPN has... Uh, uh, several, in fact, uh, telco centers. Um, uh, and these telco centers do, in fact, carry out natural language processing of uh, every conversation that takes place uh, to identify, for example, uh, side stream of events, to identify best practices for maintenance and operation, to identify uh, issues that need to be issued on software products, for example, uh, and so on and so forth. What is carrying out those NLPs, uh, uh, I tell you? Uh, it's essentially deep learning. Uh, be mindful that all of this, uh, the revolution in uh, big data and data intensive computing is obviously intrinsically connected to uh, deep learning. Uh, the big problem with uh, NLP, however, is uh, it's not explainable. The, the uh, generative uh, explanations uh, that are available for text classification. There's a few approaches, for example, from Leo et al., uh, which essentially try to guess what features uh, have been used for which prediction of which part of the text. For example, uh, at the same time, uh, explainable models like decision tree learning uh, doesn't really scale. Uh, decision tree learning, if you're not familiar with it, uh, is an algorithm that builds decision trees starting from uh, uh, domain data, domain description, essentially. It has a tendency to uh, uh, be supportive of uh, categorical data, so it would be nicely fitting uh, 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 natural language processing. But at the same time, the deterministic rules uh, that uh, you would be able to uh, to extract for any uh, NLP initiative using decision tree learning is on average 40% more inaccurate uh, than the deep learning equivalent. Uh, and this, in, this inaccuracy increases uh, uh, super linearly with the increase of data. So the more data you feed into the model, the less accurate its prediction will eventually be. Now there's a bigger problem. And the bigger problem is it doesn't scale. Uh, an NLP level decision tree uh, would be something like 8,000 decision nodes uh, uh, for a body of text, which is around one terabyte. Um, now, uh, uh, this, this is obvious uh, uh, to uh, even the most unexperienced uh, uh, computer science professional uh, that the scale here is 
uh, uh, the massive uh, problem. Um, can we help from a software engineering perspective? Can we uh, 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 introduce some uh, uh, progresses, some advances in how we deal with uh, uh, with explainability as a computational uh, uh, and software engineering problem? Um, well, there are a few things that we can do. So, for example, um, uh, uh, we can rig the machine learning operations to provide uh, uh, differently explainable models uh, uh, and the trade-offs between these models and the machine learning operations around them. So I can, uh, for example, monitor the execution of a simpler model and come up with a trade-off uh, of explainability around that trade-off. So if the model is 100% explainable, I presume that it's not going to be efficient from a, from a machine learning operations perspective. So I can uh, try to come up with a, a speed quality ratio uh, in my machine learning operations um, uh, pipeline and use that as a metric to try and improve the model incrementally. Uh, now this uh, E uh, explainability versus G of T, which would be the trade-off between uh, speed and uh, gain in terms of quality, uh, would amount to, for example, some kind of explainability debt in the scope of machine learning operations. Here I'm referring to uh, uh, technical debt as a basis for this argument. Imagine calculating the technical debt of your machine learning operations. Imagine having a metric that uh, would allow such technical debt to be elicited, kept track of, and managed in the long run. This we can definitely do. Uh, uh, this we probably should be doing uh, because it's not going to solve the explainability problem, but it is going to help uh, uh, manage it uh, in the long run. Uh, what is more beyond explainability? I have fairness, uh, and I think Chiara knows exactly uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, now, I've had uh, the pleasure and the luck maybe of uh, being engaged with a number of companies that have had prime uh, 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 prime experience with biases embedded in the behavior uh, of uh, their own AI solutions and algorithms retraining such AI solutions, reinforcing that behavior. Now, soft fairness refers to this um, to this circumstance. Soft fairness, I would say, uh, refers most especially to jurisdictional social sciences research uh, and addresses uh, fairness intended on a higher level uh, than the one which is uh, 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 reflected in the technical fairness of algorithms. So an algorithm which is capable of equally choosing for one choice over another. Um, uh, soft fairness refers to the social impact uh, of such, um, uh, uh, of such uh, ramifications. And it goes beyond the application of AI. To give you a stupid example, in 2018, uh, Reuters reported that Amazon had been working with uh, an artificial intelligence system that was sifting through the recruiting algorithm uh, and recruiting options that Amazon had provided to its own analysts to select best qualified candidates. Well, the AI uh, had a serious problem against women. So it was biased massively uh, against gender balance of uh, of the workforce. And this, to some extent, also reflects on the technical fairness, uh, uh, which reflects on the mitigation uh, of the biases that the algorithm or even the data naturally introduce uh, in uh, the algorithm operations. For example, you can think of uh, obfuscating sensitive features or uh, introducing cost performance uh, trade-offs during training. For example, I want to, uh, uh, I want to uh, promote uh, the use of explainability uh, aspects or categorical features because those are more explainable than numerical features and so on and so forth. So this refers to the so-called technical uh, fairness. Uh, now, uh, uh, I have uh, uh, tried to put together these into some kind of framework uh, together in collaboration with TNO, the, the uh, Dutch technical uh, uh, school 
uh, of AI studies. And uh, uh, it is a very simple framework, obviously, and it reflects machine learning operations. Uh, the big problem here is that neither uh, soft fairness nor technical fairness are supported by definitive research. The only thing we have currently is symbolic uh, uh, AI approaches, which are uh, essentially a mirror image to connectionist AI approaches, where connectionist AI approaches are essentially deep learning and you know mach the machine learning of, of these days. But symbolic AI reflects all sorts of uh, techniques, such as uh, ontology engineering, knowledge representation and reasoning, uh, uh, formal concept analysis, formal representation and reasoning, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, the link between symbolic AI and technical fairness is simply not there. There is no work, to my knowledge, uh, that has tried and is trying to address this link. Uh, there is some work on uh, uh, knowledge representation and reasoning, uh, as well as ontology engineering, as well as formal concept analysis in the scope of uh, the soft fairness aspects, but there is very little work in uh, the technical fairness uh, aspects thereof. Uh, now, I'm familiar with the work of Maria Paola Bonaccina, for example, who is a, a professor at uh, 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 Stony Brook University in New York. Um, now, her work uh, I'm a big fan of because it looks into the extent to which uh, symbolic execution and symbolic AI can, in fact, claim formally a basis for fairness uh, as implemented in uh, uh, specific types of executions and execution traces of specific types of software, like, for example, protocol validation software or uh, theorem proving software and so on uh, and so forth. Now, these kinds of works uh, lay down the basis of the kinds of research that, that I was proposing, uh, uh, but we're definitely not, we're definitely not there, uh, not there yet. There's no maturity, I guess. This is, uh, this is what I'm saying. Uh, furthermore than that, uh, frontier three would be accountability. Now, accountability is uh, an extent of uh, uh, liability of the AI. So suppose uh, the AI is responsible for processing a virus. Suppose this virus, uh, for some reason, leaks out of a lab. Is the AI involved in the processing of that virus partially responsible for that leaking? Can the AI be made liable? Who is responsible in any operation that deals with AI uh, executions? So any machine learning operation, who is responsible for a prediction, for example, of that specific AI? Who is responsible for specific aspects of that prediction? Who is responsible for the engineering of that prediction? Uh, should the company building the AI be held accountable? Should the company operating the AI be held accountable? Now, GDPR uh, 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 establishes that the data processor is in fact um, uh, the major responsible party, uh, but it is not as simple as that. Because uh, uh, think of the malicious use of chat GPT and in general, large language models. Uh, that malicious use cannot be ascribed to uh, the company delivering chat GPT. It would be a saying that uh, a company building or, or baking or making uh, 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 alcohol is responsible for uh, alcoholics behavior uh, in, uh, in public uh, civic duty and civic life. Uh, so, the, so it is definitely not as simple as that. Have we had cases in which this uh, is already uh, and has already been a problem? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, in connection to the pandemic, for example, AI software and several connected machine learning operations uh, had undergone uh, severe press coverage uh, because, because of essential uh, uh, short-sightedness in the sense that, for example, in Italy, uh, uh, the contact tracing app Immuni uh, was rigged uh, with Apple and Google technology, uh, which were known to be vulnerable and exploitable in terms of data processing, data use, and even malicious use of such data. Um, now, there's actually a, an equivalent to this story in South Korea, uh, in the UK. Uh, so it is not an, an isolated case. Nuts. It's, it's incredible how 
these accountability problems uh, have so much radicated uh, into uh, the daily extent of AI and machine learning operations that we don't even know uh, the extent to which uh, uh, to which such uh, uh, machine learning operations are compromised uh, by unaccountable uh, execution traces. Now, is there a way to uh, tap uh, into potential uh, that can offer this accountability year layer? Again, the answer is yes, there is. Uh, uh, there's a lot of blockchain-oriented computing, uh, which is dedicated to uh, uh, contract-based relationship and its verifiability. Now, uh, symbolic computation uh, and uh, software composability have already been uh, exploited in this scenario. Uh, blockchain, for example, has already been used uh, in the scope of representing and executing traces over distributed ledgers for uh, GDPR. And uh, what is more, technology exists um, uh, that supports uh, specific uh, proofs uh, of uh, execution in the scope of, of blockchain-oriented computing uh, by means of uh, uh, machine learning operations even. Um, so, so the potential is there, I guess. That's what I'm saying. There's plenty of technologies that can be combined uh, and can be explored in the scope of uh, uh, better and more explainable machine learning uh, and execution operations. Um, uh, wherefore, uh, 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 a large number of uh, uh, specific technologies like blockchain-oriented computing can be used and exploited uh, in actionable terms. Now, what is the frontier that I've uh, uh, coded and hardwired into the basis of this talk? Uh, that frontier is sustainability. And why is it at the basis of this talk? Because the practitioners that we involved uh, in our study uh, uh, as part of a card sorting exercise uh, were tasked, were asked to arrange uh, the priorities of these, uh, uh, of these explainability, of these frontiers uh, uh, and explainability born uh, uh, challenges. Uh, and this is the model that came up with, that we came up with. So essentially, explain, addressing explainability would lead to having more clear ideas about accountability uh, and equally clearer ideas about fairness. Uh, and uh, this would lead to uh, uh, a massively uh, sustainable uh, AI and machine learning operations. But keep in mind, sustainability means you have all three uh, at the same time. So you have an explainable AI, which is also at the same time uh, accountable and is reflective of fairness, both from a technical and soft, uh, so social perspective. And this makes it sustainable because uh, 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 the social and technical fairness makes sure that the impact uh, on society is limited and where it is limited, it is accountable. Uh, and at the same time, anyone uh, can claim, demand, and obtain explainability of such machine learning operations uh, uh, to be held, uh, in fact, accountable at the same time. Now, just to uh, recap what we mentioned uh, uh, in the previous slides, so we have some form of technical uh, or explainability debt, uh, for example, that needs to be addressed. Uh, there might be metrics that we need to discover in order for this to, to manifest. Those metrics uh, would relate to uh, the machine learning operations, uh, would relate to uh, how such machine learning operations uh, uh, perform with respect to, um, with respect to uh, uh, explainability itself. Uh, at the same time, in terms of accountability and fairness, I would claim but there is some form of social debt uh, uh, which needs to be uh, uh, kept track of uh, and maintained and managed, much like uh, uh, you would uh, maintain and manage uh, technical debt uh, from the counterpart of, uh, 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 of uh, accountability and fairness. Now, in the scope of the social debt, uh, we have uh, not so much uh, yet to uh, 
uh, uh, to sustain. Uh, uh, we, we don't really have, I mean, we have some results that lead to social debt being accounted for in the scope of software engineering, so regular software engineering, but we don't really have uh, uh, any uh, 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 clear and uh, uh, manifested results when it comes to data engineering, for example, when it comes to uh, big data and machine learning operations. Same goes for sustainability. I mean, this notion, this definition I have given here uh, is merely conceptual at this, small, at this moment, but there's very little hard research that looks into it uh, other than uh, this seminal um, uh, empirical research that we have used to hard code all of these results. Uh, by the way, all of this material is published, so you can uh, actually go and take a look. Um, uh, however, at the same time, I don't want to take uh, too much time out of your agenda. I want to leave some time for discussion uh, because I'm much more interested in your perspective and your thoughts uh, on the matter. And, and we could also go back to the slides and I can tell you a bit more uh, about the works that led to our conclusions uh, and to the conclusion that I took uh, the liberty of uh, encoding in the first few slides. So I don't want to take too much time here. Uh, I would much rather uh, leave some space for, for conversation afterwards. Uh, but I'm going to leave you with a number of take-home messages and conclusions. Um, so first of all, we have said this, we've talked about this. People of data are often strugg struggling neophytes. Uh, why do they need our help? Because the challenges that they are dealing with uh, are hard to address, even from the perspective of regular software engineers, which they are not because they are not formed as software engineers. They're not coming from computer science background. Uh, they, have, uh, they don't have enough experience in terms of software engineering to warrant appropriate and instrumented work uh, on, these, uh, on these challenges. Uh, it, now, it is our duty as software community to help these practitioners, to help these people uh, in their struggles, uh, because we... Uh, have a lot of toys that they could exploit, like, for example, symbolic execution, like, for example, uh, symbolic representation and reasoning. But we need to make, make it simpler for them to exploit and grasp these cool toys. Now, I have no uh, uh, reprimand uh, with respect to the state of the art in formal methods, for example, or uh, in uh, symbolic AI. Uh, uh, I have, however, a plea uh, to make such toys, to make such approaches usable by the regular everyday practitioner who is not a computer scientist, um, uh, because that practitioner can in fact address his or her regular problems by means of those toys. But if those toys remain unusable, then, um, uh, uh, then, then uh, uh, the research that we have been doing is essentially practically unusable. Now, uh, what can we do even in our simplest research endeavors to address this? Uh, we can, for example, prefer end user action research to regular closed door research prototypes. I have seen many researchers uh, uh, being addressed with closed indoors prototype driven experimentation. Why not including companies in such experimentation? Why not including end user action research with respect to such experimentation? Why not uh, enact user studies instead of case studies? Why not enact uh, interviews instead of uh, uh, large scale surveys even, or confirmatory uh, qualitative research which makes use of, uh, uh, of raw documents and uh, data available online? Right. I know it is more difficult. I know it is more challenging. I know practitioners themselves don't have too much space, but it is so much better uh, when uh, uh, these results are exploited in action. And they, in fact, uh, will figure out that they need your help uh, only too late in their own career. At the same time, as I already mentioned, the future is indeed bright uh, for symbolic AI and not only. Uh, I would say the future is bright for all uh, potential symbolic uh, uh, oriented formal uh, methods as applied to software and data engineering. Uh, 
uh, why is the future bright? Uh, we have seen that applying these symbolic computations to machine learning operations is the next big thing. Uh, some approaches are already ripe uh, for this uh, type of endeavor, uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, symbolic uh, computation, symbolic AI uh, is not uh, connected enough to connectionist AI. There's very little synergy there. Uh, so symbolic execution, for example, machine learning traces uh, is not uh, a real thing, is not a reality. And yet it would, for example, help uh, addressing uh, the explainability of machine learning operations. It would, for example, help address uh, 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 accountability and liability uh, of such uh, execution traces. Um, last but not least, the challenges of the future will require a holistic approach. I have mentioned already the formal and mathematical methods are extremely needed. Uh, uh, these formal mathematical methods need to be combined with more social uh, 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 disciplines because these social disciplines would be required to figure out, for example, the social and socio-technical uh, impact uh, of specific profiles of machine learning operations. Now, these social and socio-technical disciplines like social network analysis, for example, or uh, community studies uh, or anthropology or anthropometrics. Now, these kinds of disciplines would indeed be required to be combined with more formal approaches, uh, but they are not as formal themselves. So combining them together with regular science and engineering oriented disciplines is intrinsically uh, challenging. Uh, it is, in fact, a more holistic approach, but it is, in fact, intrinsically uh, challenging. So uh, the only recommendation that I can give you is try and go and look into uh, these closely related disciplines, uh, try and uh, harvest practitioners and uh, uh, collaborators in these disciplines, because the future uh, is bright for those that will go and look into these perspectives from uh, closely related disciplines, whether it is socially oriented disciplines, whether it is even theology studies. So I've had the pleasure of working with uh, some theologists uh, within uh, the outfit of Tilburg University, which I'm also uh, related to, uh, because Yatz, the institute that I dwell from, is a joint effort by uh, TU Eindhoven and uh, Tilburg University. Now, in Tilburg University, which is a more Catholic university, in such university, we have theologists. We have been using theologists, for example, to understand the extent to which an AI software uh, uh, is ethically balanced, is bound to sustain uh, 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 the operations of a community as if it was part of a religion, uh, for example. So, uh, research questions that have to do with these kinds of disciplines uh, would be uh, extremely desirable uh, and are, in fact, uh, uh, the future uh, of this discipline, especially when it comes to, uh, to machine learning operations. Uh, and with that, uh, I want to conclude my talk. Uh, I didn't uh, take uh, the full time because I want to leave uh, perhaps uh, some, some room for, for questions. Thank you, Professor, for the smooth and well paced presentation. And now we are open to receive questions so that Professor uh, can, Darmian can, can give oh, the corresponding I even response. To, yeah, I so even I forgot think, to turn in my, my camera. Sorry for that. Yeah. So please. Uh, Possible questions, you can speak. Well, I think that's uh, scared. Well, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe they're scared, but uh, I don't know because, uh, uh, because of the language, but uh, I think that's not. Uh, but Ria, you can even present uh, doubts in Portuguese, and I will can try to understand. I can help to understand questions. 
I will try to, while others uh, 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 formulate their questions, I will try to yeah. uh, make one or two questions. Okay. Uh, I saw, yeah, the, uh, for, uh, the presentation led, uh, uh, led clear that um, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, are being used uh, in uh, 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 situations of uh, uh, how, for example, we had here the COVID-19, we had uh, uh, Italy, for example, use it. Yeah. Italy use it the, uh, as you as you gave an example, the uh, tools from 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 Google and Apple which you stated uh, were vulnerable or they had vulnerabilities that could be exploited uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to get data, uh, health data. Uh, so uh, the question is, uh, uh, what account uh, following or doing the same as ETL or using it um, uh, tools that we know that uh, they have vulnerabilities. What, what can they do in order to prevent them uh, in case of, of prosecution? I mean, there must be some uh, cushions, uh, maybe in terms of uh, legal instrument, I don't know, mm -hmm. but how can they uh, find a way to use that, uh, the available tools and at the same time, um, uh, prevent them from prosecution, for example. Yeah. This is the first question. The second question is related to um, the risk. Uh, I'm just here looking to uh, uh, a statement from, from the abstract. Uh, uh, yeah, Professor said that uh, um, the more uh, this part of these platforms penetrate the day-to-day -day activity of software operation, the more the risk for artificial intelligence and software becoming unstable from social, technical, organizational perspective. So yeah. I, I think that there may be two perspectives here. One is technical perspective in terms of who implement the, uh, these tools uh, for, to try to solve problems just like the example of COVID-19, provide data for decision-making. So there is a technical uh, perspective, perspective. At the other hand, there is maybe a political perspective yeah. in terms that- Social uh, and political, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So oh, uh, in the technical perspective, imagine that I intend to implement uh, these tools Mm -hmm. to try to solve a problem, uh, just like the example of COVID-19. Uh, what I can, uh, do we have a standard, are there some standards uh, to be, or to guide the use of these uh, tools uh, for, for technical, uh, I mean, technical people in, in terms to, to implement this, these tools? And the other end, uh, how can the the, uh, the political uh, institution, for example, provide a viable environment to for the implementation of, of these tools? Okay, um, right. Let me start maybe from from the first question. So I guess the question was, what can be done to exploit known tools to implement this liability? Um, uh, characteristic, let's say, of machine learning operations. Is that correct? Words? Correct. Yeah. Uh, right. So what can be done? Well, there is a proliferation of approaches in so-called compliance checking. Uh, now, these compliance checking approaches, they offer basis for um, uh, essentially the operationalization of legal frameworks uh, during service orchestration. Now, compliance checking, however, is specifically designed so far for service operations. Like I have my microservice, 
uh, I have an orchestration uh, layer that drives that microservice, i.e. I program policies in that orchestration layer uh, uh, that, uh, that manage uh, that service. Uh, now, what can we do to instrument this liability for data intensive computing? Well, we can follow the same pattern. So we can take uh, an orchestrator, we can take a model, represent the model as if it was, for example, a microservice, uh, and then enact compliance checking at runtime for the machine learning operations, for all of the operations, training, testing, uh, deployment, execution. It is a big challenge. Uh, it doesn't help uh, uh, definitively, but it is a starting point. Uh, point is, these tools exist and somebody should start looking into it. I mean, I have tried uh, to also myself start looking into it uh, because I can recognize that it is in fact a dire uh, problem. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, I recognize that the tools are there, but it is very difficult to use these tools and to port them outside of their own operational environment, to port them to more data intensive kind of, uh, kind of scenario. Um, does that answer your, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, first you can proceed. Yeah. Right. So the second question was uh, about: uh, Are there any standards uh, or reference materials to support, uh, uh, let's say, the technical and and social and political ramifications of the use of AI in the scope of machine learning operations? The answer is no. There's no standards. Uh, every country is trying to come up with their own way of doing things. Uh, I have participated in the definition of a document uh, that provides guidelines for autonomous decision-making. So uh, let me find it and paste it in the chat room in case you are interested. Uh, now, this document was uh, edited by uh, IEEE and uh, ACM jointly, uh, because in fact, both uh, ACM and IEEE uh, uh, were sustaining uh, uh, that, that the, the operations guidelines uh, uh, were sustaining uh, the operations of AI um, uh, uh, needed some, some guidance. Recommendations, yeah, here it is. Uh, so this document contains recommendations uh, for uh, you know policy making around uh, 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 the use of AI, uh, which has uh, ramifications uh, on social and political uh, movementation. Now, my general recommendation is this. Well. One recommendation would be to, to do work in this sector would be to wait for the AI, the so-called AI Act. Uh, the AI Act uh, is going to be uh, uh, a uh, European Union uh, artificial intelligence action that will regulate uh, the execution and operation uh, and manageable, uh, uh, acceptable risk uh, of uh, use uh, of AI uh, acts. Now, the AI Act is no is not yet uh, a thing. Is not yet uh, uh, definitive. Uh, but there is an overview of uh, the legislation in its current uh, stage, uh, or maybe it became, in fact, a legislative. Uh, because I read here now that the AI Act uh, does, in fact, provide. Uh, a basis for regulation. So, um, yeah, so maybe this would be a valuable starting point for your question. So essentially, there is no standard. Uh, the European Union came up with uh, this procedure, this series of rules and regulations. It is like GDPR for artificial intelligence. Um, so I guess to answer your question, uh, every country, every continent will come up with their own standard. But if the same GDPR pattern is followed, then Europe will come up with its own and has already, because the AI Act is this list of recommendations and rules and regulations. Um, and 
uh, uh, other countries will actually follow pretty much the same uh, the same type of of path. So they will uh, most definitely follow up with uh, with their own definitions of uh, uh, AI, artificial intelligence rules and regulations. Um, does that answer your question, uh, Sergio? Yes, 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 it did. That was what I was expecting to hear. Beautiful. Uh, uh, I hope it was satisfactory. In the meantime, is there any other question, curiosity? Don't be scared. I won't eat you alive. I'll, I'll try to make it fun. And a question from the audience, please. Maybe not, uh, maybe not, uh, Professor Demer. Uh, so now it's- They're all uh, scared. It's, uh, it was very interesting, Damian. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. thanks, yeah. It's three, six. So uh, this presentation was valuable, uh, mainly in terms of uh, research. It was clear that uh, as academy, we, we have here a lot of challenges to contribute uh, uh, in terms of making the AI and uh, uh, these techniques to, to, to be appliable. Uh, and this is the future. Yeah, definitely. Kind of maybe a quick question from yeah. my part. Uh, yeah. Do you know, if, I mean, we have about 20 minutes left, I think, in our slot, right? Or do we want to uh, remain connected, maybe discuss a few of the topics a bit more? Or uh, do you have other no, I, activity schedules? Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think we're closing. We're closing okay. because uh, uh, I think the talk is for one hour. I was just addressing my congratulations to you and say All right. thank you and hope to see you again uh, in the ne next talks. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye, bye-bye.